Chapter One of Well at the World's End, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Well at the World's End, Book Four by William Morris. Ralph and Ursula come back again through the great mountains. On the morrow morning they armed them and took to their horses and departed from that pleasant place and climbed the mountain without weariness and made provision of meat and drink for the dry desert and so entered it and journeyed happily with naught evil befalling them till they came back to the house of the sorceress and of the desert they made little and the wood was pleasant to them after the drought of the desert but at the said house they saw those kind people and they saw in their eager eyes as in a glass how they had been bettered by their drinking at the well and the elder said to them dear friends there is no need to ask you whether ye have achieved your quest for ye who before were lovely are now become as the very gods who rule the world and now methinks we have to pray you but one thing to wit that ye will not be overmuch of gods but will be kind and lowly with them that needs must worship you they laughed on him for kindness sake and kissed and embraced the old man and they thanked them for all their helping and they abode with them for a whole day in good will and love and thereafter the carl who was the son of the elder with his wife bade farewell to his kinsmen and led ralph and ursula back through the wood and over the desert to the town of the innocent folk the said folk received them in all joy and triumph and would have them abide there the winter over but they prayed leave to depart because their hearts were sore for their own land and their kindred so they abode there but two days and on the third day were led away by a half score of men gaily apparelled after their manner and having with them many sumpter beasts with provision for the road with this fellowship they came safely and with little pain unto chestnut vale where they abode but one night though to ralph and ursula the place was sweet for the memory of their loving sojourn there they would have taken leave of the innocent folk in the said vale but those others must needs go with them a little further and would not leave them till they were come to the jaws of the pass which led to the rock of the fighting man further than that indeed they would not or durst not go and those huge mountains they called the wall of strife even as they on the other side called them the wall of the world so the twain took leave of their friends there and how bet that they had drunk of the well at the world's end yet were their hearts grieved of the parting the kind folk left with them abundant provision for the remnant of the road and a sumpter rocks to bear it so they were in no doubt of their livelihood moreover though the turn of autumn was come again and winter was at hand yet the weather was fair and calm and their journey through the dreary pass was as light as it might be to any men End of chapter 1Chapter 2 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4 by William Morris. Chapter 2 They Hear New Tidings of Utterbull. It was on a fair evening of later autumn tide that they won their way out of the gates of the mountains and came under the rock of the fighting man. There they kissed and comforted each other in the memory of the terror and loneliness wherewith they had entered the mountains that other time, though, sooth to say, it was to them now like the reading of sorrow in a book. But when they came out with joyful hearts into the green plain betwixt the mountains and the river of lava, 
they looked westward and beheld no great way off a little bower or cot builded of boffs and rushes by a blackthorn copse and as they rode toward it they saw a man come forth therefrom and presently saw that he was hoary a man with a long white beard then ralph gave a glad cry and set spurs to his horse galloped over the plain for he deemed that it could be none other than the sage of swevenham and ursula came pricking after him laughing for joy the old man abode their coming and ralph leapt off his horse at once and kissed and embraced him but the sage said there is no need to ask thee of tidings for thine eyes and thine whole body tell me that thou hast drunk of the well at the world's end and that shall be better for thee belike than it has been for me though for me also the world has not gone ill after my fashion since i drank of that water then was ursula come up and she also lighted down and made much of the sage but he said hail daughter it is sweet to see thee so and to what that thou art in the hands of a mighty man for i know that wrath thy man is minded for his father's house and the deeds that abide in there and i think we may journey a little way together for as for me i would go back to swevenham to end my days there whether they be long or short but ralph said as for that thou mayst go further than swevenham and as far as up meads where there will be as many to love and cherish thee as at swevenham the old man laughed a little and reddened withal but answered nothing then they untrussed their sumter beast and took meat and drink from this burden and they ate and drank together sitting on the green grass there and the twain made great joy of the sage and told him the whole tale and he told them that he had been abiding there since the springtide lest they might have turned back without accomplishing their quest and then may happen he should have been at hand to comfort them or the one of them left if so it had befallen but quoth he since ye have verily drunk of the well at the world's end ye have come back no later than i looked for you that night they slept in the bower there and on the morrow betimes the sage drove together three or four milch goats that he pastured there and went their ways over the plain and so in due time entered into the, the lava sea but the first night that they lay there though it was moonless and somewhat cloudy they saw no glare of the distant earth fires which they had looked for and when on the morrow they questioned the sage thereof he said the earth fires ceased about the end of last year as i have heard tell but sooth it is that the fourth boding of the giant's candle was not for naught for there hath verily been a change of masters at atabol yeah said ralph for better or worse said the sage it could scarce have been worse but if rumour runneth right it is much for the better hearken how i learned thereof one fair even of late march a little before i set off hither as i was sitting before the door of my house i saw the glint of steel through the wood and presently rode up a sort of knights and men at arms about a score and at the head of them a man and a big red roan horse with a surcoat blazoned with a white bull on a green field he was a man black-haired but blue-eyed not very big but well-knit and strong and looked both doughty and knightly and he wore a gold coronet about his besnet so not knowing his blazonry i wondered who it was that durst be so bold as to ride in the lands of the lord of utterbull now he rode up to me and craved a drink of milk for he'd see my goats so i milked two goats for him and brought whey for the others whereas i had no more goats in milk at that season so the bull knight spake to me about the woodland and wherefore i dwelt there apart from others somewhat rough in his speech he was yet rather jolly than fierce and he thanked me for the bever kindly enough and said i deem that it will not avail to give thee money but i shall give thee what may be avail to thee ho gervais give me one of those scrolls so a squire hands him a parchment and he gave it me and it was a safe conduct to the bearer from the lord of utterbull but whereas i saw that the seal bore not the bearer in the castle wall but the bull and that the superscription was unknown to me i held the said scroll in my hand 
and wondered. And the knight said to me, Yea, look long at it. But so it is, though thou trow it not, that I am verily lord of Utterbol, and that by conquest. So that be like, I am mightier than he was. For that mighty runagate have I slain, and many there would be who deem that no mishap, heathen though I be. Come thou to Utterbol, and see for thyself, if the days be not changed there, and thou shalt have a belly full of meat and drink, and honour after thy deserving. So they rested a while, and went their ways. To Utterbol I went not. But ere I departed to come hither, two or three carls strayed my way, as whiles they will, who told me that this which the knight had said was naught but the sooth, and that great was the change of days at Utterbol, whereas all men there, both bond and free, were as merry as they deserved to be, or be like merrier. Ralph pondered this tale, and was not so sure but that this new lord was not Bull Shockhead, his war-taken thrall. Natheless he held his peace. But Ursula said, I marvel not much at the tale, for sure I am, that had Gandalf of the Bear been slain, when I was at Utterbol, neither man nor woman had stirred a finger to avenge him. But all feared him, I scarce know why. And, moreover, there was none to be master if he were gone. Thereafter she told more tales of the miseries of Utterbol than Ralph had yet heard, as though this tale of the end of that evil rule had set her free to utter them, and they fell to talking of others' matters. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Of the Well at the World's End Book 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. They winter with the sage, and thereafter come again to Vale Turris. Thus with no peril and little pain they came to the sage's hermitage. And whereas the autumn was now wearing, and it was not to be looked for that they should cross even the mountains west of Goldberg, let alone those to the west of Cheeping No, when winter had once set in, Ralph and Ursula took the sage's bidding to abide the winter through with him, and set forth on their journey again when spring should be fairly come, and the mountain ways be clear of snow. So they dwelt there happily enough, for they helped the sage in his husbandry, and he enforced him to make them cheer, and read in the ancient book to them, and learned them as much as it behooved them to hearken, and told them tales of past time. Thereafter, when May was at hand, they set out on their road, and whereas the sage knew the wood well, he made a long story short by bringing them to Vale Turris in four days' time. But when they rode down into the dale, they saw the plain meads below the tower all bright with tents and booths, and much folk moving about amidst them. Here and there amidst the roofs of cloth withal was showing the half-finished frame of a timber-house a-building. But now as they looked and wondered what might be toward, a half-score of weaponed men rode up to them and bade them, but courteously, to come with them to see their lord. The sage drew forth his let pass thereat, but the leader of the riders said, as he shook his head, That is good for thee, father. But these two knights must needs give an account of themselves, for my lord is minded to put down all lifting throughout his lands. Therefore hath he made the meshes of his net small. But if these be thy friends, it will be well. Therefore thou art free to come with them, and bear witness to their good life. Here it must be said that since they were on the road again, Ursula had donned her war gear once more, and as she rode was to all men's eyes naught but a young and slender knight. So without more ado they followed those men-at-arms, and saw how the banner of the bull was now hung out from the tower, and the sergeants brought them into the midst of the vale, where about those tents and those half-finished frame-houses, whereof they saw six, was a market toward and much concourse of folk. But the sergeants led through them, and the lanes of the booths down to the side of the river, where on a green knoll, with some dozen of men-at-arms and captains about him, sat the new lord of Utterbol. Now, as the others drew away from him to right and left, the lord sat before Ralph with naught to hide him, 
and when their eyes met, Ralph gave a cry as one astonished, and the Lord of Utterbol rose up to his feet and shouted, and then fell a laughing joyously, and then cried out, Welcome, king's son, and look on me, for though the feathers be fine, tis the same bird. I am Lord of Utterbol, and therewithal Bull Shockhead, whose might was less than thine on the bent of the mountain valley. Therewith he caught hold of Ralph's hand, and sat himself down, and drew Ralph down, and made him sit beside him. Thou seest I am become great, said he. Yea, said Ralph, I give thee joy thereof, said the new lord. Perchance thou wilt be deeming that since I was once thy war-taken thrall, I should give myself up to thee. But I tell thee I will not, for I have much to do here. Moreover, I did not run away from thee, but thou rannest from me, lad. Thereat, in his turn, Ralph fell a-laughing, and when he might speak, he said, What needeth the lord of all these spears to beg off his service to the poor wandering knight? Then Bull put his arms about him and said, I am fain at the sight of thee. Time was thou wert a kind lad and a good master. Yet not so merry as thou shouldst have been. But now I see that gladness plays all about thy face and sparkles in thine eyes, and that is good. But these thy fellows, I have seen the old carl before. He was dwelling in the wildwood because he was overwise to live with other folk. But this young man, who may he be? Or else... Yea, verily, it is a young woman. Yea, and now I deem that it is the thrall of my brother Bullnosy. Therefore by heritage she is now mine. Ralph heard the words, but saw not the smiling face, so wroth he was. Therefore the bare sword was in his fist in a twinkling. But ere he could smite Bull, caught hold of his wrist and said, Master, master, thou art but a sorry lawyer, or thou wouldst have said, Thou art my thrall, and how shall a thrall have heritage? Dost thou not see that I cannot own her till I be free, and that thou wilt not give me my freedom save for hers? There, now is all the matter of the service duly settled, and I am free and a lord, and this damsel is free also, and, yea, is she not thy well-beloved king's son? Ralph was somewhat abashed, and said, I crave thy pardon, lord, for misdoubting thee, but think how feeble are we two lovers amongst the hosts of the aliens. It is well, it is well, said Bull, and in very sooth I deem thee my friend, and this damsel was my brother's friend. Sit down, dear maiden, I bid thee, and thou also, O man, overwise, and let us drink a cup, and then we will talk about what we may do for each other. So they sat down all on the grass, and the lord of Utterbol called for wine, and they drank together in the merry season of May, and the new lord said, here be we friends come together, and it were pity of our lives if we must need sunder speedily. Howbeit it is thou must rule herein, king's son, for in my eyes thou art still greater than I, O my master. For I can see in thine eyes and thy gait, and in thine also, maiden, that ye have drunk of the well at the world's end. Therefore I pray you gently and heartily that ye come home with me to Utterbol. Ralph shook his head and answered, Lord of Utterbol, I bid thee all thanks for thy friendliness, but it may not be. But take note, said Bull, that all is changed there, and it hath become a merry dwelling of men. We have cast down the red pillar, and the white and the black also, and it is no longer a place of torment and fear and cozening and murder, but the very thralls are happy and free-spoken. Now come ye, if it were but for a moon's wearing, I shall be there in eight days' time. Yea, Lord Ralph, thou wouldst see old acquaintance there withal. For when I slew the tyrant, who forsooth owed me no less than his life for the murder of my brother, I made atonement to his widow, and wedded her. A fair woman as thou wottest, Lord, and of good kindred, and of no ill conditions, as is well seen now that she lives happy days. Though I have heard say that while she was under the tyrant, she was somewhat rough with her women when she was sad, Eh, fair sir, but is it not so that she cast sheep's eyes on thee, time was, in this same dale? Ralph reddened, and answered not, and Bull spake again, laughing. Yea, so it is. She told me that much herself, and afterwards I heard more from her damsel Agatha, who told me the merry tale of that device they made to catch thee, and how thou breakest through the net. Forsooth, though this she told me not, 
I deem that she would have had the same gift of thee as her mistress would. Well, lad, lucky are they with whom all women are in love. So now I prithee trust so much in thy luck as to come with me to Utterbol. Quoth Ralph, Once again, Lord of Utterbol, we thank thee. But whereas thou hast said that thou hast much to do in this land, even so I have a land where deeds await me. For I stole myself away from my father and mother, and who knows what help they need of me against foemen and evil days. And now I might give help to them were I once at home, and to the people of the land also, who are stout-hearted and valiant and kindly folk. The new lord's face clouded somewhat, as he said, If thine heart draweth thee to thy kindred, there is no more to say. As for me, what I did was for kindred's sake, and then what followed after was the work of need. Well, let it be. But since we must needs part hastily, this at least I bid you, that ye abide with me for to-night, and the banquet in the great pavilion. Howsoever ye may be busied, gainsay me not this, and to-morrow I shall further you on your way, and give you a score of spears to follow thee to Goldburg. Then as for Goldburg and Cheaping No, see ye to it yourselves. But beyond Cheaping No and the plain country, thy name is known, and the likeness of thee told in words, and no man in those mountains shall hurt or hinder thee, but all thou meetest shall aid and further thee. Moreover, at the feast to-night thou shalt see thy friend Otter, and he and I betwixt us shall tell thee how I came to Utterbol, and of the change of days, and how it bitted, for he is now my right-hand man, as he was of the dead man. Forsooth, after the slaying I would have had him take the lordship of Utterbol, but he would not, so I must take it perforce, or be slain, and let a new master reign there little better than the old. Well then, how sayest thou? Wilt thou run from me without leave-taking, as thou didst erewhile at Goldburg? Ralph laughed at his word, and said that he would not be so churlish this time, but would take his bidding with a good heart, and thereafter they fell to talking of many things. But Ralph took note of Bull, that now his hair and beard were trim, and his raiment goodly. For all his rough speech and his laughter and heart-old jibes and mocking, his aspect and bearing was noble and knightly. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. Chapter 4 A Feast in the Red Pavilion. So in a while they went with him to the tower. And there was woman's raiment of the best gotten for Ursula, and afterwards at nightfall they went to the feast in the red pavilion of Utterbol, which a while ago the now slain lord of Utterbol had let make, and it was exceeding rich with broidery of pearl and gems, since forsooth gems and fair women were what the late lord had lusted for the most, and have them he would at the price of howsoever many tears and groans. But that pavilion was yet in all wise as it was wont to be, saving that the bull had supplanted the bear upon the castle wall. Now the wayfarers were treated with all honour, and were set upon the high seat, Ralph upon the right hand of the lord, and Ursula upon his left, and the sage of Swevenham out from her. But on Ralph's right hand was at first a void place, whereto after a while came Otter, the old captain of the guard. He came in hastily, and as though he had but just taken his armour off, for his raiment was but such as the men-at-arm of that country were wont to wear under their war-gear, and was somewhat stained and worn, whereas the other knights and lords were arrayed grandly in silks and fine cloth embroidered and begemmed. Otter was fain when he saw Ralph, and kissed and embraced him, and said, Forsooth I saw by thy face, lad, the world would be soft before thee. And now that I behold thee, I know already that thou hast won thy quest, and the gods only know to what honour thou shalt attain. Ralph laughed for joy of him, and yet said soberly, As to honour, meseems, I covet little world's goods, save that it may be well with my folk at home. Nevertheless, as the words were out of his mouth, his thought went back to the tall man whom he had first met at the churchyard gate of Netherton, and it seemed to him that he wished his thriving, yea, and in a lesser way, he wished the same to Roger of the rope-walk, 
whereas he deemed that both of these, each in his own way, had been true to the lady whom he had lost. Then Otter fell a-talking to him of the change of days at Utterbol, and how it was the Lord's intent that a cheaping town should grow up in the dale of the tower, and that the wilderness beyond it should be tilled and builded. And, said he, if this be done, and the new lord live to see it, as he may, being but young of years, he may become exceedingly mighty, and if he hold on in the way whereas he now is, he shall be well beloved also. So they spake of many things, and there was minstrelsy and diverse joyance, till at last the lord of Utterbol stood up and said, Now bring in the bull, that we may speak some words over him, for this is a great feast. Ralph wondered what bull this might be whereof he spake, but the harps and fiddlers and all instruments of music struck up a gay and gallant tune, and presently there came into the hall four men richly attired, who held up on spears a canopy of bodkin, under which went a man-at-arms helmed and clad in bright armour, who held in his hands a great golden cup fashioned like to a bull, and he bore it forth unto the dais, and gave it into the hands of the lord. Then straightway all the noise ceased, and the glee and clatter of the hall, and there was dead silence. Then the lord held the cup aloft, and said in a loud voice, Hail, all ye folk! I swear by the bull, and they that made him, that in three years' time or less I'll have purged all the lands of Utterbol of all strong thieves and cruel tyrants, be they big or little, till all be peace betwixt the mountains and the mark of Goldberg, and the wilderness shall blossom like the rose or else shall I die in the pain. Therewith he drank of the cup, and all men shouted. Then he sat him down, and bade hand the cup to Otter. And Otter took the cup, and looked into the bowl, and saw the wave of wine, and laughed and cried out, As for me, what shall I swear, but that I will follow the bull through thick and thin, through peace and unpeace, through grief and joy? This is my oath-swearing. And he drank mightily, and sat down. Then turned the Lord to Ralph, and said, And thou who art my master, wilt thou not tell thy friends and the gods what thou wilt do? No great matter belike, said Ralph, but if he will it, I will speak out my mind thereon. We will it, said the Lord. Then Ralph arose, and took the cup, and lifted it, and spake. This I swear, that I will go home to my kindred, yet on the road will I not gainsay help to any that craveth it. So may all hallows help me. Therewith he drank, and Bull said, This is well said, O happy man. But now that men have drunk well, do ye three and Otter come with me into the tower, whereas the chambers are dight for you, that I may make the most of this good day wherein I have met thee again. So they went with him, and when they had sat down in the goodliest chamber of the tower, and they had been served with wine and spices, the new lord said to Ralph, And now, my master, wilt thou not ask somewhat concerning me? Yea, said Ralph, I will ask thee to tell the tale of how thou camest into thy lordship. Said the lord, This shall ye hear of me with Otter to help me out. Hearken. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. Chapter 5. Bull Telleth of His Winning of the Lordship of Utterbol. When thou rannest away from me, and left me alone at Goldberg, I was grieved. Then Clement Chapman offered to take me back with him to his own country, which he did, me to wit, lieth hard by thine. But I would not go with him, since I had an inkling that I should find the slayer of my brother and be avenged on him. So the chapman departed from Goldberg after that Clement had dealt generously by me for thy sake, and when they were gone I bethought me what to do, and thou knowest I can some skill with the fiddle and song. So I betook myself to that craft, both to earn somewhat, and that I might gather tidings and be little heeded, till within a while folk got to know me well, and would often send for me to their merry-makings, where they gave me fiddler's wages, to wit meat, drink, and money. So what with one thing, what with another, I was rich enough to leave Goldberg and fall to my journey unto Utterbol, since I misdoubted me from the first that the caitiff who had slain my brother was the lord thereof. 
But one day, when I went into the market-place, I found a great stir and clutter there, some folk, both men and women, screeching and fleeing, and some running to bows and other weapons. So I caught hold of one of the fleers, and asked him what was toward, and he cried out, Loose me, let me go, he is loose, he is loose. Who is loose, fool? quoth I. The lion, said he, and therewith, in the extremity of his terror, tore himself away from me and fled. By this time the others also had got some distance away from me, and I was left pretty much alone. So I went forth on a little, looking about me, and sure enough, under one of the pillars of the cloister beneath the market-house, the great green pillar, if thou mindest it, lay crouched a huge yellow lion on the carcass of a goat, which he had knocked down, but would not fall to eating of amidst all that cry and hubbub. Now belike one thing of me thou wottest not, to wit that I have a gift that wild things love and will do my bidding. The house-mice will run over me as I lie awake looking on them. The small birds will perch on my shoulders without fear. The squirrels and hares will gambol about quite close to me as if I were but a tree. And with all the fiercest hound or mastiff is tame before me. Therefore I feared not this lion, and moreover I looked to it that if I might tame him thoroughly, he would both help me to live as a jongleur, and would be a sure ward to me. So I walked up towards him quietly, till he saw me, and half rose up growling. But I went on still, and said to him in a peaceable voice, Oh, now, yellow mane, what aileth thee? Down with thee, and eat thy meat. So he sat down to his quarry again, but growled still. And I went up close to him, and said to him, Eat in peace and safety, am I not here? And therewith I held out my bare hand unclinched to him, and he smelt to it, and straightway began to be peaceable, and fell to tearing the goat and devouring it, while I stood by, speaking to him friendly. But presently I saw weapons glitter on the other side of the square place, and men with bended bows. The yellow king saw them also, and rose up again and stood growling. Then I strove to quiet him, and said, These shall not harm thee. Therewith the men cried out to me to come away, for they would shoot. But I called out, Shoot not yet! But tell me, does any man own this beast? Yea, said one, I own him, and happy am I that he doth not own me. Said I, wilt thou sell him? Yea, said he, if thou livest another hour to tell down the money. Said I, I am a tamer of wild beasts, and if thou wilt sell this one at such a price, I will rid thee of him. The man, yea, said this, but kept well aloof with his fellows, who looked on handling their weapons. Then I turned to my new-bought thrall, and bade him come with me, and he followed me like a dog to his cage, which was hard by. And I shut him in there, and laid down the money to his owner, and folk came round about, and wondered, and praised me. But I said, My masters, have ye not of gifts for the tamer of beasts, and the deliverer of men? Thereat they laughed, but they brought me money and other goods, till I had gotten far more than I had given for the lion." Howbeit the next day the officers of the port came, and bade me avoid the town of Goldberg, but gave me more money withal. I was not loath thereto, but departed, riding a little horse that I had, and leading my lion by a chain, though when I was by he needed little chaining. So that without more ado I took the road to Utterbol, and wheresoever I came I had what was to be had that I would. Neither did any man fall on me or on my lion, for though they might have shot him, or slain him with many spear-thrusts, Yet besides that they feared him sorely, they feared me still more, deeming me some mighty sending from their gods. Thus came I to Utterness, and found it poor and wretched, as forsooth it yet is, but shall not be so for long. But the house of Utterbol is exceeding fair and stately, as thou mightest have learned from others, my master, and its gardens and orchards and acres and meadows as goodly as may be, yea, a very paradise, yet the dwellers therein as if it were hell, as I saw openly with mine own eyes. To be short, the fame of me and my beast had somehow gone before me, and when I came to the house I was dealt with fairly, and had good entertainment, and this all the more, as the Lord was away for a while, and the life of folk not so hard by a great way as it had been if he had been there. But the lady was there in the house, and on the morrow of my coming by her command, I brought my lion before her window, and made him come and go, and fetch and carry at my bidding, and when I had done my play she bade me up into her bower, and bade me sit and had me served with wine, while she asked me many questions as to my country and friends, and whence and whither I was, and I answered her with the very sooth so far as the sooth was handy, and there was with her but one of her women, even thy friend Agatha, fair sir. Methought both that this queen was a fair woman, and that she looked kindly upon me, and at last she said, sighing, that she were well at ease if her baron were even such a man as I, 
whereas the said lord was fierce and cruel, and yet a dastard withal. But the said Agatha turned on her, and chided her as one might with a child, and said, Hold thy peace of thy loves and thy hates before a very stranger, or must I leave yet more of my blood on the pavement of the white pillar for the pleasure of thy loose tongue? Come out now, mountain carl. And she took me by the hand, and led me out. And when we had passed the door, and it was shut, she turned to me and said, Thou, if I hear any word abroad of what my lady has just spoken, I shall know that thou hast told it, and though I be but a thrall, yea, and of late a mishandled one, yet am I of might enough in Utterbol to compass thy destruction. I laughed in her face, and went my ways, and thereafter I saw many folk, and showed them my beast, and soon learned two things clearly. And first the lord and the lady were now utterly at variance, for a little before he had come home, and found a lack in his household, to wit how a certain fair woman whom he had but just got hold of, and whom he lusted after sorely, was fled away, and he laid the white thereof on his lady, and threatened her with death. And when he considered that he durst not slay her or torment her, for he was verily but a dastard, he made thy friend Agatha pay for her, under pretense of wringing a true tale out of her. Now when I heard this story, I said to myself that I should hear that other one of the slaying of my brother, and even so it befell. For I came across a man who told me when and how the Lord came by the said damsel, whom I knew at once could be none other than thou, lady, and how he had slain my brother to get her, even as doubtless thou knowest, Lord Ralph. But the second thing which I learned was that all folk at Utterbol, men and women, dreaded the homecoming of this tyrant, and that there was no man but would have deemed it a good deed to slay him. But dastard as he was, use and want, and the fear that withholdeth rebels, and the doubt that draweth back slaves, saved him and they dreaded him moreover as a devil rather than a man. Forsooth one of the men there who looked upon me friendly, who had had tidings of this evil beast drawing near, spake to me a word of warning, and said, Friend lion master, take heed to thyself, for I fear for thee when the Lord cometh home and findeth thee here, lest he let poison thy lion and slay thee miserably afterward. Well, in three days from that word, home cometh the Lord with a rout of his spearmen, and some dozen of captives whom he had taken. And the morrow of his coming, he, having heard of me, sent and bade me showing the wonder of the man and the lion. Therefore, in the bright morning, I played with the lion under his window, as I had done by the queen. And after I had played some while, and he looking out of the window, he called to me and said, Canst thou lull thy lion to sleep, so that thou mayst leave him for a little? For I would fain have thee up here. I yea said that, and chid the beast, and then sang to him, till he lay down and slept like a hound weary with hunting. And then I went up into the Lord's chamber, and as it happed all the while of my playing, I had had my short sword naked in my hand. And thus, I deem without noting it, yet as weird would, I came before the tyrant, where he sat with none anigh him save this otter and another man-at-arms. But when I saw him all the blood within me that was come of one mother with my brother's blood stirred within me, and I set my foot on the footpace of this murderer's chair, and hove up my short sword and clave his skull, in front and with mine own hand, not as he wrought, not as he wrought with my brother. Then I turned about to Otter, who had his sword in his fist when it was too late, till he should speak. Ha, Otter, what didst thou say? Otter laughed. Quoth he, I said, Thus endeth the worst man in the world. Well done, lion tamer. Thou art no ill guest, and hast paid on the nail for meat, drink, and lodging. But what shall we do now? Then thou saidst, Well, I suppose thou wilt be for slaying me. Nay, said I, we will not slay thee, at least not for this, nor now, nor without terms. Thou saidst, Perchance then thou wilt let me go free, since this man was ill-beloved, yea, and he owed me a life. Nay, nay, said I, not so fast, good beast-lord. Why not, saidst thou, I can see of thee that thou art a valiant man, and whereas thou hast been captain of the host, and the men-at-arms will lightly do thy bidding, why shouldst thou not sit in the place of this man, and be lord of Utterbol? Nay, nay, said I, it will not do, hearken thou rather, for here I give thee the choice of two things, either that thou be lord of Utterbol, or that we slay thee here and now, for we be two men all armed. Thou didst seem to ponder it a while, and then saidst at last, Well, I set not out on this journey with any such like intent, yet will I not wrestle with weird, only I forewarn thee that I shall change the days of Utterbol. It will not be for the worst, then, quoth I. So now go wake up thy lion, and lead him away to his den, and we will presently send him this carrion for the reward of his jonglery. 
Gramercy, butcher, saidst thou. I am not for thy flesh meat today. I was forewarned that the poor beast should be poisoned at this man's homecoming, and so will he be if he eat of this dastard. He will not outlive such a dinner. Thereat we all laughed heartily. Yea, said Bull, so I went to lead away the lion when thou hadst bidden me return in an hour's wearing, when all should be ready for my lordship. And thou wert not worse than thy word, for when I came into that court again, there were all the men-at-arms assembled, and the free carls and the thralls. And the men-at-arms raised me on a shield, set a crowned helm on my head, and thrust a great sword into my hand, and hailed me by the name of the Bull of Utterbull, Lord of the Waste and the Wildwood and the Mountain Side. And then thou, Otter, wert so simple as to kneel before me and name thyself my man, and take the girding on of sword at my hand. Then even as I was, I went in to my lady and told her the end of my tale, and in three minutes she lay in my arms, and in three days in my bed as my wedded wife. As to Agatha, when I had a little cheered her, I gave her rich gifts and good lands and freedom, to boot her for her many stripes. And lo there, king's son and sweet lady, the end of all my tale. Yea, quoth Otter, saving this, that even already thou hast raised up Utterbull from hell to earth, and yet beseemeth thou hast good will to raise it higher. Bull reddened at his word, and said, Tush, man, praise the day when the sun has set. Then he turned to Ralph and said, It couldst thou at whiles put in a good word for me, here and there amongst the folks that thou shalt pass through on thy ways home. I were fain to know that I had a well-speaking friend abroad. We shall do no less, said Ralph. And Ursula spake in like wise. So they talked together merrily a while longer, till night began to grow old, and then went to their chambers in all content and good liking. End of chapter 5「Chapter six of the Well at the World's End, Book four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book four by William Morris. Chapter six. They ride from Vale Turris. Redhead tells of Agatha. On the morrow, when they arose, Ralph heard the sound of horses and the clashing of arms. He went to the window and looked out, and saw how the spears stood up thick together at the tower's foot, and knew that these were the men who were to be his fellows by the way. Their captain he saw, a big man all armed in steel, but him seemed that he knew his face under his sallet, and presently saw that it was Redhead. He was glad thereof, and clad himself hastily, and went out of doors, and went up to him and hailed him, and Redhead leapt off his horse, and cast his arms about Ralph, and made much of him, and said, it is good for sore eyes to see thee, Lord, and I am glad at heart that all went well with thee that time, although forsooth there was guile behind it. Yet whereas I wotted nothing thereof, which I will pray thee to believe, and whereas thou hast the gain of all, I deem thou mayst pardon me. Said Ralph, Thou hast what pardon of me thou needest, so be content. For the rest little need is there to ask if thou thrivest, for I behold thee glad and well honoured. As they spoke, came the lord forth from the tower, and said, Come thou, Lord Ralph, and eat with us ere thou takest the road. I mean with Otter and me. As for thee, Redhead, if aught of ill befall this king's son under thy way leading, look to it thou shalt lose my good word with Agatha, yea, or gain my naysay herein, whereby thou shalt miss both fee and fair dame. Redhead looked sheepishly on Ralph at that word, yet winked at him also, as if it pleased him to be jeered concerning his wooing, so that Ralph saw how the land lay, and that the guileful handmaid was not ill content with that big man. So he smiled kindly on him, and nodded, and went back with Bull into the tower. There they sat down all to meet together, and when they were done with their victual, Bull spake and said to Ralph, Fair king's son, is this then the last sight of thee? Wilt thou never come over the mountains again? Said Ralph, who knoweth, I am young yet, and have drunk of the water of the well. Bull grew somewhat pensive, and said, Yea, thou meanest that thou mayest come back, and find me no longer here. Yet if thou findest but my grave mound, yet may happen thou shalt come on something said or sung of me, which shall please thee. For I will tell thee that thou hast changed my conditions, how I wot not. Thy word is good, said Ralph, yet I meant not that. Never should I come to Utterbull if I looked not to find thee living there. Bull smiled on him as though he loved him, and said, This is well spoken. 
I shall look to see thee before I die. Then said Ursula, Lord of Utterbol, this also thou mayest think on, that it is no further from Utterbol to Upmeads than from Upmeads to Utterbol. The Lord laughed and said, Sooth is that, and were but my bull here, as I behold you, I should be of mine to swear by him to come and see you at Upmeads, ere ten years have worn. Then she put forth her hand, and said, Swear by this. So he took it and swore the oath. But the sage of Swevenham said, This oath thou shalt keep to the gain, and not the loss, both of thee and of thy friends of Upmeads. Thus were they fain of each other, and Ralph saw how Bull's heart was grown big, and he rejoiced thereat. But anon he arose, and said, Now, Lord, we ask leave to depart, for the way is long, and may happen my kindred now lack a man's helping. Then Bull stood up and called for his horse, and Otter also, and they all went forth and got a horseback, and rode away from Vale Turris, and Redhead rode behind them humbly, till it was noon and they made stay for meat. Then after they had broken bread together and drunk a cup, Bull and Otter kissed the wayfarers, and bade them farewell, and so rode back to Vale Turris, and Ralph and Ursula and the sage tarried not, but rode on their ways. But anon Ralph called to Redhead, and bade him ride beside them that they might talk together. And he came up with them, and Ursula greeted him kindly, and they were merry one with another. And Ralph said to Redhead, Friend, Captain, thou art exceeding in humility not to ride with the lord or Captain Otter. Save for chance up, I see not that thou art worser than they. Redhead grinned, and said, Well, as to Otter, that is all true. But as for Lord Bull, it is another matter. I wot not, but his kindred may be as good or better than any in these east parts. In any case, he hath his kin, and long descent full often in his mouth, while I am but a gangrel body. Howbeit it is all one, whereas what so he or Otter bid any man to do, he doeth it. But my bidding may be questioned at whiles. And look you, Lord, times are not ill, so wherefore should I risk a change of days? Sooth to say, both these great lords have done well by me. Ralph laughed. And better will they do as thou deemest. Give thee Agatha to wit. Yea, fair sir, quoth Redhead. No great gift that seemeth to me for thy valiancy, said Ralph. She is guileful enough and loose enough for a worse man than thee. Lord, said Redhead, even of her thou shalt say what pleaseth thee. But no other man shall say of her what pleaseth me not. For all that is come and gone she is true and valiant, and none may say that she is not fair and sweet enough for a better man than me. And my great good luck it is that, as I hope, she looketh no further for a better. Ursula said, Is it so, perchance, that now she is free, and hath naught to fear, she hath no need for guile? Hail to thee for thy word, lady, quoth Redhead. And then he was silent, glooming somewhat on Ralph. But Ralph said, Nay, my friend, I meant no harm, but I was wondering what had befallen to bring you two so close together. It was fear and pain and the helping of each other that wrought it, said Redhead said Ursula. Good captain, how is it that she escaped the uttermost of evil at the tyrant's hands? Since from all that I have heard it must needs be that he laid the blame on her, working for her mistress, of my flight from Utterbol. Even so it was, lady, said Redhead. But, as thou wottest belike, she had got it spread abroad that she was cunning in sorcery, and that her spell would not end when her life ended. Nay, that he to whom her ghost should bear ill will, and more especially such an one as might compass her death, should have but an ill time of it while he lived, which should not be long. This tale, which, sooth to say, I myself helped to spread, the Lord of Utterbol trowed in wholly, so cunningly was it told, so that to make a long story short he feared her, and feared her more dead than living, so that when he came home and found thee gone, lady, he did indeed deem that thy flight was of Agatha's contrivance, and this the more because his nephew, he whom thou didst beguile, I partly guess how, told him a made-up tale of how all was done by the spells of Agatha. For this youth was of all men not even saving his uncle, most full of malice. And he hated Agatha, and would have had her suffer the uttermost of torments, and he to be standing by the while. Howbeit his malice overshot itself, since his tale made her even more of a witch than the Lord deemed before. Yea, said Ursula, and what hath befallen that evil young man, Captain? Said Redhead, It is not known to many, lady. But two days before the slaying of his uncle I met him in a wood a little way from Utterbol, and the mood being on me I tied him neck and heels, and cast him with a stone round his neck into a deep woodland pool height, the ram's bane, which is in that same wood. Well, as to my tale of Agatha, 
when the lord came home first he sent for her and his rage had so mastered his fear for a while that his best word was scourge and rack and faggot but she was outwardly so calm and cold smiling on him balefully that he presently came to himself a found that fear was in his belly and that he might not do what he would with her wherefore he looked to it that however she were used which was ill enough god wot she should keep the soul in her body and at last the fear so mounted into his head that he made peace with her and even craved forgiveness of her and gave her gifts she answered him sweetly indeed yet so as he and all others who were bystanding of whom i was one might well see that she deemed she owed him a day in harvest as for me he heeded me not and i lay low all i might and in any wise we wore the time till the great day of deliverance therewith dropped the talk about agatha when they had bidden him all luck in his life forsooth they were fain of his words and of his ways withal for he was a valiant man and brisk and one who forgot no benefit and was trusty as steel merry-hearted withal and kind and ready of speech despite his uplandish manners which a life not a little rude had thrust on him end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Well at the World's End, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter is read by Jacques Godreau. You can visit my blog at http colon forward slash forward slash forum of one dot the blog press dot com. The Well at World's End. Book Four by William Morris. Chapter Seven of Their Riding the Waste and of a Battle Thereon. They slept in no house that night, nor for many nights after, for they were now fairly on the waste. They bore with them a light tent for Ursula's lodge in Benites, and the rest of them slept on the field as they might, or should they come to a thicket or shaw, they would lodge them there softly victual and drink failed them not for they bore what they needed on sumpter horses and shot some venison on the way withal they saw but few folks for the most part not save a fowler of the waste or a peat cutter who stood to look on the men-at-arms going by and made obeisance to the token of odebal but on a time the fifth day of their journey they saw in the morning spears not a few standing up against a thicket side in the offing redhead looked under the sharp of his hand and laughed as though he were glad and said i know not clearly what these may be but it looketh like war now knight this is the best to do hold with thee three of our best men so that ye may safeguard the lady and i with the others will prick on and look into this nay said ralph thou mayest yet be a paid of a man's aid and if there be strokes on sale in the cheaping stead yonder i will deal along with thee leave thy three men with the lady and let us on we shall soon be back nay once more dear lord quoth ursula i fear to be left alone of thee and it is meet that thou free me from fear i will ride with you but three horse lengths behind so as not to hinder you i have been worse bestead than this shall be it is good quoth redhead let her ride with us for why should she suffer the pain of fear in the lonely waste but let her do on a halbeck over her coats and still quaff over her head for shaft and bolt will oft time go astray even so they did and rode forward and presently they saw the spearmen that they were somewhat more than their company and that they were well mounted on black horses and clad in black armour then they drew rein for a while and redhead scanned them ahead and said yea these men are the men of the brother of thy hot war lady ursula whom i cooled in the ram's bane but i have a man well nigh as old as his uncle though he hath not made men tremble so sore i'll bait he be far the better man a good warrior a wise leader a raver and lifter well wrought of at all points well tis not unlike that we shall have to speak to his men again either go outgoing or homecoming so we had best kill as many as these as we may now do on thy salest my lord and thou michael a green shake out the bull and thou 
our noise blow a point of war that they may be warned god to aid but they be ready and speedy in sooth even as the pennon of the bull ran down the wind and the utter ball horn was winded the black men-at-arms came on at a trot and presently with a great screeching yell cast their spears into the rest and spurred on all their might while a half score of bowmen who had come out of the thicket bent their bows and fell a shooting but now the men of uterbal spurred to meet the foe and as redhead cast his spear into the rest he said to ralph glad am i that thy lady is anear to see me for now i worship her therewith the two bands met and whereas on neither side was the armour very stout some men of either band were hurt or slain at once with spear thrust though save for ralph they did not run straight on each other but fenced and foined with their spears deftly enough as for ralph he smote a tall man full on the breast and pierced him through and through and then pulled out the upmeads blade and smote on the right hand and left so that none came anigh him willingly shortly to say it in five minutes time the black riders were fleeing all over the field with them of Udabal at their heels, and the bowmen ran back again into the wood. But one of the foemen, as he fled, cast a javelin at the venture. And who should be before it save Ursula? So that she reeled in her saddle, and would have fallen downright, but for one of the Udabal fellows who stayed her, and got her gently off her horse. This Ralph saw not, for he followed far into the chase, and was coming back somewhat slowly along with Redhead, who was hurt but not sorely. So when he came up and saw Ursula sitting on the grass with four or five men about her, he sickened for fear, but she rose up and came slowly and pale-faced to meet him, and said, Fear not, beloved, for steel kept out steel. I have no scratch or point or edge on me. So therewith he kissed her and embraced her and was glad. The Uterbal riders had slain sixteen of their foemen, for they took none to mercy, and four of their band were slain outright, and six hurt, but not grievously. So they tarried a while on the field of deed to rest them, and tend their wounded men, and so rode on again heedfully. But Redhead spake, It is good to see thy tilting king's son. I doubt me I shall never learn the, thy downright thrust. Dost thou remember how sorry a job I made of it when we met in the list at Vale Tures that other day? Yea, yea, said Ralph, though we're best let that flea stick on the wall, for to-day at least I have seen thee play at sharps deftly enough. Quoth Redhead, Lord, it is not a five-minute scramble. That which trieth a man is to fight and overcome and straight have to fight with fresh foemen and yet again till ye long for dark nights to cover you yea or even death warrior-like and wisely thou speakest said ralph and whoever thou servest thou shalt serve well and now once more i would it were me redhead shook his head at that word and said i would it might be so but it will not be so as now forth on they rode and slept in a wood that night keeping good watch but saw no more of the black riders for that time on a day thereafter when it was nigh evening ralph looked about and saw a certain wood on the edge of a plain and he stayed ursula and said look round about beloved for this is where the very field whereas i was betrayed into the hands of the men of Udubal. she smiled on him and said let me light down then that i may kiss the earth of that kind field where thou wert not stayed over long but even long enough that we might meet in the dark woods thereafter sweetling said ralph this mayest thou do and grieve no man not even for a little for lo you the captain is staying the sumpter beast and it is his mind belike that we shall sleep in yonder wood to-night therewith he lighted down and she in likewise then he took her by the hand and led her on a few yards and said lo beloved this quickened tree hereby it was that the tent was pitched whereas i lay the night i was taken she looked on him shyly and said wilt thou not sleep here once more to-night yea well beloved said he 
I will bid them pitch thy tent on this same place, that I may smell the wild thyme again, as I did the other while. So there on the field, in his ancient grief, they rested that night in all love and content. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. Chapter 8 Of Goldberg Again, and the Queen Thereof. Next day they went forth through the country where through Morfin had led Ralph into captivity, and Redhead rode warily, for there were many passes which looked doubtful. But whether the ill men feared to meddle with them, or however it were, none waylaid them, and they all came safely to the gate of Goldberg, the towers whereof were full of folk looking forth on them. So they displayed their pennon, and rode into the street, where folk pressed about them in friendly wise, for the new lord of Utterbol had made firm and fast peace with Goldberg. So they rode to the hostel, and gat them victual, and rested in peace that night. But Ralph wondered whether the queen would send for him when she heard of his coming back again, and he hoped that she would let him be, for he was ashamed when he thought of her love for him, and how that he had clean forgotten her till he was close to Goldberg again. But when morning was come, Ralph spake to Redhead, and asked him how he should do to wage men for the homeward journey on thence. And Redhead said, I have already seen the clerk of the port, and he will be here in an hour with a license for thee to wage men to go with thee to Cheaping No. As for me, I must needs go see the king, and give him a letter sealed by my lord's hand. And when I come back from him, I will go round to the alehouses which be haunted of the men-at-arms to see after strong carls for thine avail. But to the king hast thou no need to go, save he send for thee whereas thou art not come hither to chaffer, and he needeth not men of war. Ralph stared at him, and said, The king, sayest thou, is there no queen of Goldberg? Said Redhead, There is the king's wedded wife, but her they call not queen, but lady. But the queen that was, said Ralph, where is she then? Yea, truly, said Redhead, a queen sat alone as ruler here a while ago, but whether she died or what befell her I know nothing. I had little to do with Goldberg till our lord conquered Utterbol. Lo, here the host, he may tell thee the tale thereof. Therewith he departed, and left Ralph with the host, whom Ralph questioned of the story, for his heart was wrung lest such a fair woman and so friendly should have come to harm. So the host sat down by Ralph, and said, My master, this is a tale which is grievous to us, for though the saints forbid I should say a word against my lord that is now, nor is there any need to, Yet we deemed us happy to be under so dear a lady, and so good and fair as she was. Well, she is gone so that we wot not whether she be living or dead. For so it is that in the early spring, somewhat more than a year ago, that is, one morning when folk arose, the queen's place was empty. Riding and running there was about and about, but none the more was she found. For sooth as time wore, tales were told of what wise she left us and why, but she was gone. Well, fair sir, many deemed that though her lineage was known by seeming, yet she was of the fairy, and needed neither steed nor chariot to go where she would. But her women, and those that knew her best, deemed that whatso she were, she had slain herself, as they thought, for some unhappiness of love. For indeed she had long gone about sad and distraught, though she neither wept, nor would say one word of her sorrow, whatsoever it might be. But, fair sir, since thou art a stranger, and art presently departing from our city, I will tell thee a thing. To wit, one month or so after she had vanished away, I held talk with a certain old fisherman of our water, and he told me that on that same night of her vanishing, as he stood on the water-side, handing the hawser of his bark, and the sail was all ready to be sheeted home, there came along the shore a woman going very swiftly, who, glancing about her, as if to see that there was none looking on or prying, came up to him, and prayed him in a sweet voice for instant passage down the water. Wrapped she was in a dark cloak and a cowl over her head, but as she put forth her hand to give him gold, he saw even by the light of his lantern that it was exceeding fair, and that great gems flashed from the finger-rings, and that there was a great gold ring most precious on her arm. 
He yea said her asking, partly because of her gold, partly, as he told me, that he feared her, deeming her to be of the fairy. Then she stepped over his gangway of one board on to his boat, and as he held the lantern low down to light her, lest she should make a false step and fall into the water, he noted, quoth he, that a golden shoe, all begimmed, came out from under gown him, and that the said him was broidered thickly with pearl and jewels. Small was his bark, and he alone with the woman, and there was a wind in the March night, and the stream is swift betwixt the keys of our city, so that by night and cloud they made much way down the water, and at sunrise were sailing through the great wood which lieth hence a twenty leagues seaward. So when the sun was risen she stood up in the fore part of the boat, and bade him turn the bark toward the shore, and even as the bows ran upon the sand she leapt out and let the thicket cover her, nor have any of Goldberg seen her since, or the queen. But for my part I deem the woman to have been none other than the queen. Seest thou then, she is gone. But the king Reynold, her cousin, reigns in her stead, a wise man and a mighty, and no tyrant or skinner of the people. Ralph heard and pondered, and was exceeding sorry, and more had he been but for the joyousness which came of the water of the well. Howbeit he might not amend it, for even were he to seek for the queen and find her, it might well be worse than letting it be, for he knew, when he thought of her, that she loved him, and how would it be if she might not outwear her love, or endure the days of Goldberg, and he far away? This he said to himself, which he might not have said to any other soul. End of chapter 8「Toward evening comes Redhead, and tells Ralph how he hired him a dozen men-at-arms to follow him well-weaponed to Cheaping Now. Withal he counselled him to take a good gift with him to that same town, to buy the good will of the king there, who was a close fist and a cruel lord. Afterwards they sat together in the court of that fair house before good wine, Ralph and Ursula, and Redhead and the sage of Swippenham, and spake of many things, and were merry and kind together. But on the morrow Redhead departed from Goldberg with his men, and he loathed to depart, and they gave him farewell lovingly. Thereafter Ralph's new men came to him in the hostelry, and he feasted them and did well to them, so that they praised him much. Then he gat him victuals and sumpter horses for the journey, and bought good store of bows and arrows withal. Furthermore he took heed to Redhead's word, and bought a goodly gift of silver vessel and fine cloth for the king of Cheaping No. The day after he and his company departed from Goldberg toward the mountains, which they passed unfought and unwaylaid, partly because they were a band of stout men, and partly because a little before there had been a great overthrow of the wild men of those mountains at the hands of the men of Goldberg and the chapmen, so that now the mountain men lay close, and troubled none that rode with any force. On the way they failed not to pass by the place where they had erst found Bull Nosey slain. There they saw his howe heaped up exceeding high, covered in with earth, whereon the grass was now beginning to grow, and with a great standing stone on the top thereof, whereon was graven the image of a bull, with a sword thereunder, whereby the wayfarers wotted that this had been done in his memory by his brother, the new lord of Utterbull. So they came down out of the mountains to Whiteness, where they had good entertainment, but tarried not, save for one night, riding their ways betimes to Cheaping No. And they came before the gate thereof safe and sound on the third day, and slept in the hostelry of the chapmen. On the morrow Ralph went up to the king's castle, with but three men unweaponed, bearing the gift which he had got for the king. Albeit he sent not away his men-at-arms, till he should know how the king was minded towards him. As he went he saw in the streets sad tokens of the lord's cruel justice, as handless men, fettered, dragging themselves about, and folk hung up before chapmen's booths, and whipping cheer, and the pillar, and such like. But whereas he might not help, he would not heed, but came right to the castle gate, and entered easily when he had told his errand, for gift-bearing men are not oftenest withstood. He was brought straightway into the great hall, where sat the king on his throne amidst the chiefs of the port, and his captains and sergeants, who were, so to say, his barons, though they were not barons of lineage, but masterful men, who were wise to do his bidding. 
as he went up the hall he saw a sort of poor caitiffs women as well as men led away from the high place in chains by bailiffs and tipstaves and he doubted not that these were for torments or maiming and death and thought it were well might he do them some good being come to the king he made his obeisance to him and craved his good will and leave to wage men at arms to bring him through the mountains the king was a tall man a proper man of war long-legged black-bearded and fierce-eyed some word he had heard of ralph's gift therefore he was gracious to him he spake and said thou hast come across the mountains a long way fair sir prithee on what errand answered ralph for no errand lord save to fare home to mine own land where is thine own land said the king stretching out his legs and lying back in his chair west away lord many a mile said ralph yea quoth the king and how far didst thou go beyond the mountains as far as utterbol said ralph yet further but not to utterbol ha said the king who goeth beyond utterbol must have a great errand what was thine ralph thought for a moment and deemed it best to say as little as he might concerning ursula so he answered and his voice grew loud and bold i was minded to drink a draught of the well at the world's end and even so i did as he spake he drew himself up and his brows were knit a little but his eyes sparkled from under them and his cheeks were bright and rosy he half drew the sword from the scabbard and sent it back rattling so that the sound of it went about the hall he upreared his head and looked around him on this and that one of the warriors of the aliens and he sniffed the air into his nostrils as he stood alone amongst them and set his foot down hard on the floor of the king's hall and his armor rattled upon him but the king sat bolt upright in his chair and stared ralph's face and the warriors and lords and merchants fell back from ralph and stood in an ordered rank on either side of him and bent their heads before him none spoke till the king said in a hoarse voice but lowly and wheedling tell us fair sir what is it that we can do to pleasure thee king said ralph i am not here to take gifts but to give them rather yet since thou biddest me i will crave somewhat of thee that thou mayst be the more content and moreover the giving shall cost thee nothing i crave of thee to give me life and limb and freedom for the poor folk whom i saw led down the hall by thy tipstaves even now give me that or nothing the king scowled but he spake this is indeed a little gift of thee to take yet none else save thee had i given it therewith he spake to a man beside him and said go there set them free and if any hurt hath befallen them thy life shall answer for it is it enough fair sir and have we thy good will ralph laughed for joy of his life and his might and he answered king this is the token of my good will fear not of me and he turned to his men and bade them bring forth the gift of goldberg and open it before the king and they did so but when the king cast eyes on the wares his face was gladdened for he was a greedy wolf and whoso had been close to his mouth would have heard him mutter so mighty yet so wealthy but he thanked ralph aloud and in smooth words and ralph made obeisance to him again and then turned and went his ways down the hall and was glad at heart that he had become so mighty a man for all fell back before him and looked on him with worship howbeit he had looked on the king closely and wisely and deemed that he was both cruel and guileful so that he rejoiced that he had spoken naught of ursula and he was minded to keep her within gates all the while they abode at cheaping no when he came to the hostel he called his men-at-arms together and asked them how far they would follow him and with one voice they said all that they would go with him whereso he would so that it were not beyond reason so they arrayed them for departure on the morrow and were to ride out of gates about mid-morning so wore the day to evening but ere the night was old came a man asking for ralph as one who would have a special alms of him a poor man by seeming and evilly clad but when ralph was alone with him the poor man did him to wit that for all his seeming wretchedness he was but disguised and was in sooth a man of worship and one of the port quoth he i am of the king's council and i must needs tell thee a thing of the king that though he was at the first overawed and cowed by the majesty of thee a friend of the well he presently came to himself which was but ill so that what for greed what for fear even he is minded to send men to waylay thee some three leagues from the town on your way to the mountains but ye shall easily escape his gin now i have had speech of thee for ye may take a by-road 
and fetch a compass of some twelve miles, and get a back of the waylayers. Yet, if ye escape this first ambush, unless ye are timely in riding early to-morrow, it is not unlike that he shall send swift riders to catch up with you ere you come to the mountains. Now I am come to warn thee hereof, partly because I would not have so fair a life spilt, which should yet do so well for the sons of Adam, and partly also because I would have a reward of thee for my warning and my way leading, for I shall show thee the way and the road. Said Ralph, Ask and fear not, for if I may trust thee, I already owe thee a reward. My name is Michael Adale, said the man, and from Swevenham I came hither, and fain would I go thither, and little hope I have thereof, save I go privily in some such band as thine, whereas the tyrant holdeth me on pain, as well I know, of an evil death. I grant thine asking, friend, said Ralph, and now thou wert best go to thine house, and trust what stuff thou mayst have with thee, and come back hither in the grey of the morning. The man shook his head, and said, Nay, here must I bide night long, and go out of gates amongst thy men-at-arms, and clad like one of them, with iron enough about me to hide the fashion of me. It were no wise safe for me to go back into the town, for this tyrant wages many a spy. Yea, forsooth I fear me by certain tokens, that it is not all so certain that I have not been spied upon already, and that it is known that I have come to thee. And I will tell thee that by hook or by crook the king already knoweth somewhat of thee, and of the woman who is in thy company. Ralph flushed red at that word, and felt his heart bound, but even therewith came into them the sage, and straightway Ralph took him apart, and told him on what errand the man was come, and asked him if he deemed him trusty. Then the sage went up to Michael, and looked him hard in the face a while, and then said, Yea, honest he is, unless the kindred of Michael of the Hatch of Swevenham have turned thieves in the third generation. Yea, said Michael, and dost thou know the Hatch? As I know mine own fingers, said the sage, and even so I knew it years and years before thou wert born. Therewith he told the newcomer what he was, and the two men of Swevenham made joy of each other, and Ralph was fain of them, and went into the chamber wherein sat Ursula, and told her how all things were going, and she said that she would be naught but glad to leave that town, which seemed to her like to Utterball over again. End of chapter 9《ハプター・テン・オブ・ザ・ウェル・アット・ワールド・エンド・ボック・フォー・ This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Well at the World's End》Book Four by William Morris。Chapter Ten《An Adventure on the Way to the Mountains》on the morrow ralph got his men together betimes and rode out a gates and was little afraid that any should meddle with him within the town or anigh it and even so it turned out but michael rode in the company new clad and with his head and face all hidden in a wide sallet as for ralph and ursula they were exceeding glad and now that their heads were turned to the last great mountains it seemed to them that they were verily going home and they longed for the night that they might be alone together and talk of all these matters in each other's arms. When they were out of gates, they rode for two miles along the highway, heedlessly enough by seeming, and then, as Michael bade, turned suddenly into a deep and narrow lane, and forth on, as it led betwixt hazeled banks and coppices of small wood, skirting the side of the hills, so that it was late in the afternoon before they came into the highway again, which was the only road leading into the passes of the mountains. Then said Michael that now by all likelihood they had beguiled the waylayers for that time, so they went on merrily till half the night was worn, when they shifted for lodging in a little oak wood by the wayside. There they lay not long, but were afoot betimes in the morning, and rode swiftly day long, and lay down at night on the wayside with the less dread, because they were come so far without hurt. But on the third day, somewhat after noon, when they were come up above the tilled upland, and the land was rough and the ways steep, there lay before them a dark wood swallowing up the road. Thereabout Ralph deemed that he saw weapons glittering ahead, but was not sure, for as clear-sighted as he was. So he stayed his band, and had Ursula into the rearward, and bade all men look to their weapons, and then they went forward heedfully and in good order, and presently not only Ralph, but all of them could see men, standing in the jaws of the pass with the wood on either side of them, and though at first they doubted if these were aught but mere strong thieves, such as any wayfarers might come on. They had gone but a little further when Michael knew them, for the riders of Cheaping know. 
Yea, said the sage of Swevenham, it is clear how it has been. When they found that we came not that first morning, they had an inkling of what had befallen, and went forward toward the mountains, and not back to Cheaping No, and thus outwent us while we were fetching that compass to give them the go-by. Wherefore I deem that some great man is with them, else had they gone back to town for new orders. Well, said Ralph, then will they be too many for us. So now will I ride ahead, and see if we may have peace. Said the sage, Yea, but be wary, for thou hast to do with a guileful. Then Ralph rode on alone, till he was come within hail of those waylayers. Then he thrust his sword into the sheath, and cried out, Will any of the warriors in the woods speak with me, for I am the captain of the wayfarers? Then rode out from those men a very tall man, and two with him, one on either side, and he threw back the sallet from his face, and said, Wayfarer, all we have weapons in our hands, and we so many that thou and thine will be in regard of us as the pips to the apple. Wherefore yield ye? Quoth Ralph, Unto whom then shall I yield me? Said the other, To the men of the king of Cheaping No. Then spake Ralph, What will ye do with us when we are yolden? Shall we not pay ransom and go our ways? Yea, said the tall man, and this is the ransom that ye give up into my hands my dastard who hath bereaved me, and the woman who windeth in your company. Ralph laughed, for by this time he knew the voice of the king, yea, in the face of him under his sallet. So he cried back in answer, and in such wise as if the words came rather from his luck than from his youth, Ho, oh, Sir King, beware, beware, lest thou tremble when thou seest the bare blade of the friend of the well, more than thou tremblest erst when the blade was hidden in the sheath before the throne of thine hall. But the king cried out in a loud, harsh voice, Thou young man, beware thou, and try not thy luck overmuch. We are as many as these trees, and thou canst not prevail over us. Go thy ways free, and leave me what thou canst not help leaving. Yea, fool, cried Ralph, and what wilt thou do with these two? Said the king, the traitor I will flay, and the woman I will bed. Scarce were the words out of his mouth, ere Ralph gave forth a great cry and drew his sword, set spurs to his horse, and galloped on up the road with all his band at his back, for they had drawn nigh amidst this talk. But wherever they came on the foemen, they heard a great confused cry of onset, mingled with affright, and lo, the king threw up his arms, and fell forward on his horse's neck with a great arrow through his throat. Ralph drave on sword in hand, crying out, Home, home to Upmeads! And anon was amidst of the foes, smiting on either hand. His men followed, shouting, Ho for the friend of the well! And amongst the foemen, who were indeed very many, was huge dismay, so that they made but a sorry defence before the band of the wayfarers, who knew not what to make of it, till they noted that arrows and casting spears were coming out of the wood on either side, which smote none of them, but many of the foemen. Short was the tale, for in a few minutes there were no men of the foe together save those that were fleeing down the road to Cheaping No. Ralph would not suffer his men to follow the chase, for he wotted not with whom he might have to deal besides the king's men. He drew his men together, and looked round for Ursula, and saw that the sage had brought her up anigh him, and there she sat a horseback, pale and panting with fear of death and joy of deliverance. Now Ralph cried out from his saddle in a loud voice, and said, Ho ye of the arrows of the wood! Ye have saved me from my foemen. Where be ye, and what be ye? Came a loud voice from out of the wood on the right hand. Children, tell the warrior whose sons ye be. Straightway break out a huge bellowing on either side of the road, as though the wood were all full of great neat. Then cried out Ralph, If ye be of the kindred of the bull, ye will belike be my friends rather than my foes. Or have ye heard tell of Ralph of Upmeads? Now let your captain come forth and speak with me. Scarce were the words out of his mouth ere a man came leaping forth from out of the wood, and stood before Ralph in the twilight of the boughs, and Ralph noted of him that he was clad pretty much like to bull shockhead of past time, save that he had a great bull's head for a helm, which afterwards Ralph found out was of iron and leather, and a great gold ring on his arm. Then Ralph thrust his sword back into the sheath, and his folk handled their weapons peaceably, while Ralph hailed the newcomer as lord or duke of the bulls. Belike, quoth the said chieftain, thou wouldst wish to show me some token, whereby we may wot that thou art that friend of the well, and of our kinsman concerning whom he sent us a message. Then Ralph bethought him of the pouch with a knot of grass, therein which Bull Shockhead had given him at Goldberg. So he drew it out, and gave it into the hand of the chieftain, who no sooner caught a glimpse thereof than he said, 
Verily our brother's hand hath met thine when he gave thee this. Yet forsooth, now that I look on thee, I may say that scarce did I need token to tell me that thou wert the very man. For I can see thee that thou art of great honour and worship, and thou didst ride boldly against the foemen when thou knewest not that we had waylaid thy waylayers. Now I wot that there is no need to ask thee whether thou wouldst get thee out of our mountains by the shortest road. Yet wilt thou make it little longer and somewhat safer, if ye will suffer us to lead thee by way of our dwelling. So Ralph yea said his bidding without more words. As they spake thus together, the road both above and below was become black with weaponed men, and some of Ralph's band looked on one another as though they doubted their new friends somewhat. But the sage of Swevenham spoke to them and bade them fear not, for, said he, so far as we go, who are now their friends, there is no guile in these men. The bull captain heard him and said, Thou sayest sooth, old man, and I shall tell thee that scarce had a band like thine come safe through the mountains, save by great good luck without the leave of us. For the fool with a crown that lieth there dead had of late days so stirred up the folks of the fells through his grimness and cruelty, that we have been minded to stop everything bigger than a cur dog that might seek to pass by us, for at least so long as yonder rascal should live. But ye be welcome, so now let us to the road, for the day weareth. So the tribesmen gat them into order, and their duke went on the left side of Ralph, while Ursula rode on his right hand. The duke and all his men were afoot, but they went easily and swiftly as wolves trot. As for the slain of the waylayers, of whom there were some three score, the bull captain would do naught but let them lie on the road. For, said he, there be wolves and lynxes enough in the wood, and the ravens of the uplands and the kites shall soon scent the carrion. They shall have burial soon enough. Neither will we meddle with it, nay, not so much as to hang the felon king's head at thy saddle-bow, lord. By sunset they were out of the wood, and on the side of a rough fell, so they went no further, but lighted fires at the edge of the thicket, and made merry round about them, singing their songs concerning the deeds of their folk, and jesting with all, but not foully. And they roasted venison of heart and hind at the fires, and they had with them wine, the more part whereof they had found in the slain king's carriages. And they made great feast to the wayfarers, and were exceeding fain of them, after their fashion, whereas if a man were their friend, he could scarce be enough their friend, and if we were their foe, they could never be fierce enough with him. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4 by William Morris. Chapter 11 They Come Through the Mountains Into the Plain. On the morrow, early they all fared on together, and thereafter they went for two days more till they came into a valley amidst of the mountains which was fair and lovely, and therein was the dwelling or town of this folk of the fells. It was indeed no stronghold, save that it was not easy to find, and that the way thither was well defensible were foemen to try it. The houses thereof were artless, the chiefest of them like to the great barn of an abbey in our land, the others low and small, but the people, both men and women, haunted mostly the big house. As for the folk, they were for the more part like those whom they had met afore, strong men, but not high of stature, black-haired, with blue or grey eyes, cheerful of countenance, and of many words. Their women were mostly somewhat more than comely, smiling, kind of speech, but not suffering the caresses of aliens. They saw no thralls amongst them, and when Ralph asked hereof how that might be, since they were men-catchers, they told him that when they took men and women, as oft they did, they always sold them for what they would bring to the plain-dwellers, or else slew them, or held them to ransom, but never brought them home to their stead. Howbeit, when they took children, as wiles befell, they sometimes brought them home, and made them very children of their folk, with many uncouth prayers and worship of their gods, who were indeed, as they deemed, but forefathers of the folk. 
Now Ralph, he and his, being known for friends, these wild men could not make enough of them, and, as it were, compelled them to abide there three days, feasting them, and making them all the cheer they might. And they showed the wayfarers their manner of hunting, both of the hart and the boar, and of wild bulls also. At first Ralph somewhat loathed all this, though he kept a pleasant countenance toward his host, for sorely he desired the fields of Upmeads and his father's house. But at last, when the hunt was up in the mountains, and especially of the wild bulls, the heart and the might of him so arose that he enforced himself to do well, and the wild men wondered at his prowess, whereas he was untried in this manner of sports, and they deemed him one of the gods, and said that their kinsmen had done well to get him so good a friend. Both Ursula and the sage withheld them from this hunting, and Ursula abode with the women, who told her much of their ways of life, and stories of old time. Frank and free they were, and loved her much, and she was fain of such manly-minded women after the slight and lies of the poor thralls of Utterbol. On the fourth day the wayfarers made them ready and departed, and the chief of the folk went with them with a chosen band of weaponed men, partly for the love of his guests and partly that he might see the Goldberg men-at-arms safe back to the road upon the plain and the mid-house of the mountains, for they went now by other ways, which missed the said house. On this journey naught befell to tell of, and they all came down safe into the plain. There the Goldberg men took their wage, and bidding farewell, turned back with the wild men, praising Ralph much for his frankness and open hand. As for the wild men, they exceeded in their sorrow for the parting, and many of them wept and howled as though they had seen him die before their faces. But all that came to an end, and presently their cheer was amended, and their merry speech and laughter came down from the pass unto the wayfarer's ears as each band rode its way. End of chapter 11 Chapter Twelve of The Well at the World's End, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book Four by William Morris. Chapter Twelve The Roads Sunder Again. Ralph and Ursula, with the sage and Michael a Dale, went their ways, and all was smooth with them, and they saw but few folk and those mild and lowly. At last, of an afternoon, they saw before them afar off the towers and pinnacles of Whitwall, and Ralph's heart rose within him so that he scarce knew how to contain himself, but Ursula was shy and silent, and her colour came and went, as though some fear had hold of her. Now they two were riding on somewhat ahead of the others, so Ralph turned to Ursula and asked what ailed her. She smiled on him and said, a simple sickness. I am drawing nigh to thy home, and I am ashamed. Beyond the mountains, who knew what and whence I was? I was fair, and for a woman not unvaliant, and that was enough. But now, when I am coming amongst the baronages and the lineages, what shall I do to hold up my head before the fools and the dastards of these high kindreds? And that all the more, my knight, because thou art changed since yesteryear, and since we met on the wantway of the wood perilous, when I bade thee remember that thou wert a king's son, and I a yeoman's daughter. For then thou wert but a lad, high-born and beautiful, but simple, maybe, and untried. Whereas now thou art meet to sit in the Kaiser's throne, and rule the world from the holy city. He laughed gaily, and said, What? Is it all so soon forgotten, our deeds beyond the mountains? belike because we had no minstrel to rhyme it for us. Or is it all but a dream? And has the last pass of the mountains changed all that for us? What then? Hast thou never become my beloved, nor lain in one bed with me? Thou whom I looked to deliver from the shame and the torment of Utterbol, never didst thou free thyself without my helping, and meet me in the dark wood, and lead me to the sage who rideth yonder behind us? No, nor didst thou ride fearless with me, leaving the world behind, nor didst thou comfort me when my heart went nigh to breaking in the wilderness, nor did thee I deliver as I saw thee run naked from the jaws of death. 
nor were we wedded in the wilderness far from our own folk, nor didst thou deliver me from the venom of the dry tree. Yea, verily, nor did we drink together of the water of the well. It is all but tales of Swevenham, a blue vapour hanging on the mountains yonder. So be it, then, and here we ride together, deedless, a man and a maid, of whom no tale may be told. What next, then, and who shall sunder us? Therewith he drew his sword from the sheath, and tossed it into the air, and caught it by the hilts as it came down, and he cried out, Hearken, Ursula, by my sword I swear it, that when I come home to the little land, if my father and my mother and all my kindred fall not down before thee and worship thee, then will I be a man without kindred, and I will turn my back on the land I love, and the house wherein I was born, and will win for thee and me a new kindred, that all the world shall tell of. So help me St. Nicholas and all hallows, and the mother of God. She looked on him with exceeding love, and said, Ah, beloved! how fair thou art is it not as i said yea and more that now lieth the world at thy feet if thou wilt stoop to pick it up believe me sweet all folk shall see this as i see it and shall judge betwixt thee and me and deem me not beloved he said thou dost not wholly know thyself and i deem that the mirrors of steel serve thee but ill and now must thou have somewhat else for a mirror, to wit, the uprising and increase of trouble concerning thee and thy fairness, and the overstrife of them that love thee overmuch, who shall strive to take thee from me, and that the blade that hath seen the well at the world's end shall come out from his sheath and take me and thee from the hubbub and into the quiet fields of my father's home, and then shalt thou be learned of thyself, when thou seest that thou art the desire of all hearts." Ah, the wisdom of thee, she said, and thy valiancy, and I am become feeble and foolish before thee. What shall I do then? He said, Many a time shall it be shown what thou shalt do. But here and now, as the highway dry and long, and the plain meads and acres on either hand, and a glimmer of Whitwall afar off, and the little cloud of dust about us too in the late spring weather, and the sage and Michael riding behind us, and smiting dust from the hard road. And now, if this also be a dream, let it speedily be gone, and let us awake up in the ancient house at Upmeads, which thou hast never seen, and thou and I in each other's arms. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of The Well at the World's End, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Well at the World's End, Book 4, by William Morris. Chapter 13. They Come to Whitwall Again. Herewith they were come to a little thorpe where the way sundered, for the highway went on to Whitwall, and a byway turned off to Swevenham. Thereby was a poor hostel, where they stayed and rested for the night, because evening was at hand. So when those four had eaten and drunk there together, Ralph spoke and said, Michael Adale, thou art for Swevenham to-morrow. Yea, lord, said Michael, belike I shall yet find kindred there. And I call to thy mind that I craved of thee to lead me to Swevenham, as payment for all, if I had done aught for thy service. Sooth is that, said Ralph, thou shalt go with my good will. And, as I deem, thou shalt not lack company betwixt here and Swevenham, whereas our dear friend here, the friend of thy father's father, is going the same road. Then the sage of Swevenham leaned across the board and said, What word hath come out of thy mouth, my son? Said Ralph, smiling on him, It is the last word which we have heard from thee of this matter, though verily it was spoken a while ago. What wilt thou add to it as now? This, quoth the sage, that I will leave thee no more till thou biddest me go from thee. Was this word needful? Ralph reached his hand to him and said, It is well and more, but the road hence to Upmeads may yet be a rough one. Yea, said the sage, yet shall we come thither all living, unless my sight now faileth. Then Ursula rose up and came to the old man and cast her arms about him and said, Yea, father, come with us and let thy wisdom bless our roof tree. Wilt thou not teach our children wisdom? Yea, maybe our children's children, since thou art a friend of the well. 
I know not of the teaching of wisdom, said the sage, but as to my going with thee, it shall be as I said e'en now, and forsooth I looked for this bidding of thee to make naught of the word which I spoke, ere yet I had learned wisdom of thee. Therewith were they merry, and fain of each other, and the evening wore amidst great content. But when morning was come, they gat to horse, and Ralph spake to Michael, and said, Well, friend, now must thou ride alone to thy kindred, and may fair days befall thee in Swevenham. But if thou deem at any time that matters go not so well with thee as thou wouldst, then turn thine head to Upmeads, and try it there, and we shall further thee all we may. Then came the sage to Michael as he sat upon his horse, a stalwart man of some forty winters, and said, Michael a Dale, reach me thine hand. So did he, and the sage looked into the palm thereof, and said, This man shall make old bones, and it is more like than not king's son, that he shall seek to thee at Upmeads ere he die. Said Ralph, his coming shall be a joy to us, how pleasant soever our life may be otherwise. Farewell, Michael, all good go with thee for thine wholesome reeds. So then Michael gave them farewell, and rode his ways to Swevenham, going hastily, as one who should hurry away from a grief. But the three held on their way to Whitwall, and it was barely noon when they came to the gate thereof on a Saturday of latter May. It was a market day, and the streets were thronged, and they looked on the folk and were fain of them, since they seemed to them to be something more than aliens. The folk also looked on them curiously, and deemed them goodly, both the old man and the two knights, for they thought no otherwise of Ursula than that she was a carl. But now as they rode slowly because of the crowd up Petergate, they heard a cry of one beside them, as of a man astonished but joyful. So Ralph drew rein and turned thither whence the cry came, and Ursula saw a man wide-shouldered, grey-haired, blue-eyed, and ruddy of countenance, a man warrior-like to look on, and girt with a long sword. Ralph lighted down from his horse, and met the man who was coming toward him, cast his arms about his neck, and kissed him, and, lo, it was Richard the Red. The people round about when they saw it clapped their hands, and crowded about the two, crying out, Hail to the friends long parted and now united! But Richard, who most knew, cried out, Make way, my masters, will ye sunder us again? Then he said to Ralph, Get into thy saddle, lad, for surely thou hast a tale to tell over long for the open street. Ralph did as he was bidden, and without more ado they went on all toward that hostelry where Ralph had erst borne the burden of grief. Richard walked by Ralph's side, and as he went he said, Moreover, lad, I can see that thy tale is no ill one. Therefore my heart is not wrung for thee or me, though I wait for it a while. Then again he said, Thou doest well to hide her loveliness in war-weed, even in this town of peace. Ursula reddened, and Richard laughed, and said, Well, it is a fair rose which thou hast brought from east away. There will be never another couple in these parts like you. Now I see the words on thy lips, so I tell thee that Blaze thy brother is alive and well and happy, which last word means that his coffer is both deep and full. Forsooth he would make a poor bargain in buying any kingship that I wot of, so rich he is, yea, and mighty withal. Said Ralph, And how went the war with Walter the Black? Even as he spake his face changed, for he bethought him over closely of the past days, and his dream of the Lady of Abundance and of Dorothea, who rode by him now as Ursula. But Richard spake, Short is the tale to tell. I slew him in shock of battle and his men craved peace of the good town. Many were glad of his death, and few sorrowed for it, for fair as his young body was, he was a cruel tyrant. Therewith were they come to the hostel of the Lamb, which was the very same house wherein Ralph had abided aforetime. And as he entered it, it is not to be said but that inwardly his heart bled for the old sorrow. Ursula looked on him lovingly and blithely, and when they were within doors, Richard turned to the sage and said, Hail to thee, reverend man! But thou forty years older to behold, outworn and forgotten of death, I should have said that thou wert like to the sage that dwelt alone amidst the mountains nigh to Swevenham, when I was a little lad, and fearsome was the sight of thee unto me. The sage laughed and said, Yea, somewhat like am I yet to myself of forty years ago. Good is thy memory, Greybeard. Then Richard shook his head and spake under his breath, Yea, then it was no dream or coloured cloud, and he hath drank of the waters, and so then hath my dear lord. Then he looked up bright-faced, and called on the serving-men, and bade one lead them into a fair chamber, and another go forth and provide a banquet to be brought in thither. 
So they went up into a goodly chamber high aloft, and Ursula went forth from it a while, and came back presently clad in very fair woman's raiment, which Ralph had bought for her at Goldburg. Richard looked on her and nothing else for a while. Then he walked about the chamber uneasily, now speaking with the sage, now with Ursula, but never with Ralph. At last he spake to Ursula and said, Grant me grace, lady, and be not wroth if I take thy man into the window yonder, that I may talk with him privily while ye hold converse together, thou and the sage of Swevenham. She laughed merrily and said, Sir nurse, take thy bantling, and cosset him in whatso corner thou wilt, and I will turn away mine eyes from thy caresses. So Richard took Ralph into a window and sat down beside him and said, May happen I shall sadden thee by my question, but I mind me what our last talking together was about, and therefore I must needs ask thee this, was that other one fairer than this one is? Ralph knit his brows. I wot not, quoth he, since she is gone, that other one. Yea, said Richard, but this I say, that she is without a blemish. Did ye drink of the well together? Yea, surely, said Ralph, said Richard. And is this woman of good heart? Is she valiant? Yea, yea, said Ralph, flushing red. As valiant as was that other, said Richard. Said Ralph, how may I tell, unless they were tried in one way? Yet Richard spake, are you wedded? Even so, said Ralph. Dost thou deem her true, said Richard. Truer than myself, said Ralph, in a voice which was somewhat angry. Quoth Richard, then is it better than well, and better than well. For now hast thou wedded into the world of living men, and not to a dream of the land of fairy. Ralph sat silent a little, and as if he were swallowing somewhat. At last he said, Old friend, I were well content if thou were to speak such words no more, for it irks me and woundeth my heart. Said Richard, Well, I will say no more thereof. Be content therefore, for now I have said it, and thou needest not fear me, what I have to say thereon any more, and thou mayest well wot that I must needs have said somewhat of this. Ralph nodded to him friendly, and even therewith came in the banquet which was richly served as for a king's son, and wine was poured forth of the best, and they feasted and were merry. And then Ralph told all the tale of his wanderings, how it had betid, bringing in all that Ursula had told him of Utterbol, while as for her she put in no word of it. So that at last Ralph, being wishful to hear her tell somewhat, made more of some things than was really in them, so that she might set him right. But no word more she said for all that, but only smiled on him now and again, and sat blushing like a rose over her golden-flowered gown, while Richard looked on her and praised her in his heart exceedingly. But when Ralph had done the story, which was long, so that by then it was over it had been dark night some while, Richard said, Well, Fosterling, thou hast seen much, and done much, and many would say that thou art a lucky man, and that more and much more lieth ready to thine hand. Whither now wilt thou wind, or what wilt thou do? Ralph's face reddened, as its wont had been when it was two years younger, at contention drawing nigh, and he answered, Where then should I go, save to the house of my fathers, and the fields that fed them? What should I do but live amongst my people, warding them from evil, and loving them, and giving them a good counsel? For wherefore should I love them less than heretofore? Have they become dastards, and the fools of mankind? Quoth Richard, they are no more fools than they were belike, nor less valiant. But thou art grown wiser and mightier by far, so that thou art another manner man than thou wert, and the master of masters, maybe. To Upmeads wilt thou go, but wilt thou abide there? Upmeads is a fair land, but a narrow. One day is like another there, save when sorrow and harm is blent with it. The world is wide, and now I deem that thou holdest the glory thereof in the hollow of thine hand. Then spake the sage, and said, Yea, Richard of Swevenham, and how knowest thou but that this sorrow and trouble have not now fallen upon Upmeads? And if that be so, upon whom should they call to their helping rather than him who can help them most, and is their very lord? Said Richard, It may be so, wise man, though as yet we have heard no tidings thereof. But if my lord goeth to their help, yet when the trouble shall be over, will he not betake him thither where fresh deeds await him? Nay, Richard, said the sage, Art thou so little a friend of thy fosterling as not to know that when he hath brought back peace to the land, it will be so that both he shall need the people and they him, so that if he go away for a while, yet shall he soon come back? 
Yea, and so shall the little land, it may be, grow great. Now had Ralph sat quiet while this talk was going on, and as if he heeded not, and his eyes were set as if he were beholding something far away. Then Richard spoke again after there had been silence a while. Wise man, thou sayest sooth. Yea, and so it is, that though we here have heard no tale concerning war and upmeads, yet, as it were, we have been feeling some stirring of the air about us, even as though matters were changing, great might undone, and weakness grown to strength. Who can say but our Lord may find deeds to hand, or ever he come to Upmeads? Ralph turned his head as one awaking from a dream, and he said, When shall tomorrow be, that we may get us gone from Whitwall, we three, and turn our faces toward Upmeads? Said Richard, Wilt thou not tarry a day or two, and talk with thine own mother's son, and tell him of thine haps? Yea, said Ralph, and so would I, were it not that my father's trouble and my mother's grief draw me away. O oh, tarry not, said Ursula, nay, not for the passing of the night, but make this hour the sunrise, and be gone by the clear of the moon, for lo, how he shineth through the window. Then she turned to Richard and said, O oh, fosterer of my love, knowest thou not that as now he speaketh as a friend of the well, and wotteth more of far-off tidings than even this wise man of many years? Said Ralph, she saith sooth, O Richard, or how were it if the torch were even now drawing nigh to the high house of Upmeads, yea, or if the very house were shining as a dreary candle of the meadows, and reddening the waters of the ford, what do we here? Therewith he thrust the board from him, and arose, and went to his harness, and fell to arming him. And he spake to Richard, Now shall thine authority open to us the gates of the good town, though the night be growing old. We shall go our ways, dear friend, and may happen we shall meet again, and may happen not. And thou shalt tell my brother Blaze, who wotteth not of my coming hither, how things have gone with me, and how need hath drawn me hence. And bid him come see me at Upmeads, and to ride with the good man of proper men, for eschewing the dangers of the road. Then spake Richard, I shall tell Lord Blaze neither more nor less than thou mayst tell him thyself, for think it not that thou shalt go without me. As for Blaze, he may well spare me, for he is become a chief and lord of the port, and the port hath now right good men-at-arms, and captains withal younger and defter than I be. But now suffer me to send a swain for my horse and arms, and another to the captain of the watch at Westgate Bar, that he be ready to open to me and three of my friends, and to send me a let-pass for the occasion. So shall we go forth, ere it be known that the brother of the lord of the port is abiding at the Lamb. For verily I see that the lady hath spoken truth, and it is like that she is foreseeing, even as thou hast grown to be. And now I bethink me I might likely get me a score of men to ride with us, whereas we may meet men worse than ourselves on the way. Said Ralph, All good go with thy words, Richard, yet gather not force. There may stout men be culled on the road, and if thou runnest or ridest about the town, we may yet be stayed by Blaze and his men. Wherefore now send for thine horse and arms, and bid the host here open his gates with little noise when we be ready, and we will presently ride out by the clear of the moon. But thou, beloved, shalt don thine armour no more, but shalt ride henceforth in thy woman's raiment, for the wild and the waste is well nigh over, and the way is but short after all these months of wandering. And I say that now shall all friends drift toward us, and they that shall rejoice to strike a stroke for my father's son, and the peaceful years of the friend of the well. To those others, and chiefly to Ursula, it seemed that now he spoke strongly and joyously like to a king and a captain of men. Richard did his bidding, and was swift in dealing with the messengers. But the sage said, Ralph, my son, since ye have lost one man-at-arms, and have gotten but this golden angel in his stead, I may better that. I prithee bid thy man, Richard, find me arm and weapons, that I may amend the shard in thy company. Thou shalt find me no feeble man when we come to push of staves. Ralph laughed, and bade Richard see to it. So he dealt with the host, and bought good war-gear of him, and a trenchant sword, and an axe withal. And when the sage was armed, he looked as dirty a warrior as need be. By this time was Richard's horse and war-gear come, and he armed him speedily, and gave money to the host, and they rode therewith all four out of the hostel, and found the street empty and still, for the night was wearing. So rode they without tarrying into Westgate, and came to the bar, and speedily was the gate opened to them and anon were they on the moonlit road outside of Whitwall. End of chapter 13
of the well at the world's end book four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the well at the world's end book four by william morris chapter fourteen they ride away from whitwall but when they were well on the way and riding a good pace by the clear of the moon richard spake to ralph and said whither ride we now and ralph whither save to upmeads yea yea said richard but by what road shall we ride down to the ford of the swelling flood and ride the beaten way or take to the downland and the forest and so again by the forest and downland and the forest once more till we come to the burg of the four friths which way is the shorter said ralph forsooth said richard by the wild wood ye may ride shorter if ye know it as i do quoth the sage yea or as i do here a wonder that two men of swevenham know the wilds more than twenty miles from their own thorpe said ralph well wind we the shorter road why make more words over it or what lion lieth on the path is it that we may find it hard to give the go-by to the burg of the four friths said richard though the burg be not very far from whitwall we hear but little tidings thence our chapmen but seldom go there and none cometh to us thence save such of our men as have strayed thither yet as i said e'en now in the hostel there is an air of tidings abroad and one rumour saith and none denieth it that the old fierceness and stout headstrong mood of the burg is broken down and that men dwell there in peace and quiet said the sage in any case we have amongst us lore enough to hoodwink them if they be foes so that we shall pass easily naught of this need we fear but richard put his mouth close to ralph's ear and spake to him softly shall we indeed go by that shorter road whatever in days gone by may have befallen in places thereon to which we must go anigh to-morrow ralph answered softly in turn yea forsooth for i were fain to try my heart how strong it may be so they rode on and turned off from the road that led down to the ford of the swelling flood an eye which ralph had fallen in with blaze and richard on the day after the woeful slaying which had made an end of his joy for that time but when they were amidst of the bushes and riding a deep gill of the waste richard said it is well that we are here for now if blaze send riders to bring us back courteously they shall not follow us at once but shall ride straight down to the ford and even cross it in search of us yea said ralph it is well in all wise so then they rode thence a while till the moon grew low and great and red and sank down away from them and by then were they come to a shepherd's cot empty of men with naught therein save an old dog and some victual as bread and white cheese and a well for drinking so there they abode and rested that night end of chapter fourteen